at Ithaca Vineyard newsletter, um, definitely sign up for that at ithacavineyard.com backslash, uh, sorry, ithacavineyard.org backslash news. Um, and the link will be posted in the chat as well. Um, at this time, um, we're gonna transition um, to our main message um, from Ward. And then afterwards, there will be um, a return to our breakout groups, um, a time of corporate sharing um, and prayer, and then we'll come back together uh, to close the service. Um, so go ahead and take it away, Ward. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to see your faces. I um, hope that you are experiencing the peace of the Lord during this, this difficult time. And uh, would you would you pray with me? Let's just pray together as a as a a family, real quickly. Father, we um, look to you. You are our rock. You're our fortress. You're our foundation. Our hope is in you. And Father, we come before you today, and we ask that you would come with your peace, and that you would guard our hearts and guard our minds. Father, we trust you to provide what we need during this time. And Father, would you use this time to uh, build us into uh, a temple in which you dwell by your spirit? Lord, would you help us to grow in maturity so that we might grow into Christ, who is the head? Lord Jesus, we love you. We ask that you would be present here by your Holy Spirit. We worship you. And we love you. Amen. So in the first century, the cities, the cities of the Mediterranean world were crowded, filthy, and dangerous. Most people lived in one room blocks of tenements that often rose more than five stories high, some as high as six or seven stories. The higher floors were typically inhabited by the poorer residents who often subdivided their rooms, which led to many of these tenements collapsing. In addition, most people both cooked their food and heated their apartments with charcoal braziers. So fires were a constant danger, for instance, over the course of 600 years, Antioch, one of the largest cities in the Roman Empire, burned four times. The Roman writer Juvenal, who was writing in the first century, referred to Rome as an endless nightmare of fires and collapsing houses. So in light of all this, therefore, it shouldn't have been surprising when from the 19th to the 27th of July, in AD 64, the tenements and palaces of Rome were swept by a fire that grew into a great conflagration that when it finally burned out, left the vast majority of the city a smoking ruin. Only four of the 14 neighborhoods uh, of Rome were left intact after the fire burned itself out. The emperor at the time was Nero, and although his reign began with high hopes, and he was quite popular, his despotic and fr quite frankly, his psychotic behavior uh, began to turn the populace against him. So that by the time of the fire, people were willing to believe the worst of him. The ru rumor began to circulate that he purposely set the fire in order to make room for a new palace that he wanted to build. The Roman historian Tacitus, who was actually writing not long after the events he recounts, um, describes what happened next. He writes, but all human efforts, all the lavish gifts of the emperor and the propitiations of the gods did not banish the sinister belief that the conflagration was the result of an order by Nero. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. So why did Nero blame the Christians? Well, one reason was because, as Tacitus states, Christians were already viewed with hatred and suspicion by the populace, and so they made an easy scapegoat. Jonah Lendring points to another possible reason, 
because the first Roman Christians were Jews, they would have lived in the Jewish quarter located near where the fire started. Tacitus continues, Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous superstition thus checked for the moment again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. Accordingly, an arrest was made, first made of all who pleaded guilty, then upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city as of hatred against mankind. Mockery of every sort was added to their deaths. Covered with the skins of beasts, they were torn by dogs and perished or were nailed to crosses or were doomed to the flames and burnt to serve as a nightly illumination when daylight had expired. Now, as I mentioned before in this series, the series that we're doing on the book of Hebrews, uh, Apollos in his letter is most likely writing to a small group of Jewish Christians living in Rome at the point at which um, blame for the fire is beginning to focus on Christians and they've begun to experience persecution, but it hasn't progressed to the point yet where they're being killed. But they see the writing on the wall. They see what's coming and they're rightfully terrified. So how does Apollos comfort them? Right? Does he tell them, look, God's going to deliver you from this? Or, Don't worry, Jesus is going to come back and rapture you so you won't have to go through suffering? Well, let's see what he, what he says. We're going to pick up in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 4 to 11. Hebrews 12, verses 4 to 11. He writes, in your struggle against sin, you've not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father, addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship is discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So Apollos is trying to encourage these cons converts as they face a worsening persecution. And one way he does this is to tell them that the hardship they're experiencing, right, the confiscation of their goods, the public ridicule, is a good sign. Why? Well, because it means they're God's children and God is disciplining them because he loves them and wants them to grow in maturity. In fact, the word Apollos uses for discipline is the same word used in Luke 23 when Pontius Pilate refers to his desire to scourge and whip Jesus and then release him. You brought me this man, Pilate declares, I've examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Therefore, I will punish or I will discipline him and then release him. So what Apollos is doing is explaining his reader's experience of suffering from an Old Testament perspective. He quotes Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 to 12. My son, don't despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. See, the view of Proverbs is that an earthly father shows his love for his children by disciplining them. And the view of the Old Testament is that God shows his love for his people in the same way, by disciplining them when necessary for their own good. You see this throughout the history of the Jewish nation. 
the Jews begin to oppress the poor. They engage in sexual immorality. They begin to worship other gods. They subvert justice. And therefore, God brings hardship on them so they repent and once again do what is right. So Apollos is telling the Christians he's writing to that just like the Israelites, they're experiencing hardship because God loves them and is disciplining them for their good. And Apollos asserts, if they submit to what God is doing, then they will grow in spiritual maturity. He puts it this way, right? We have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Okay. So what does this mean practically for us? Right? What can we learn from this passage of scripture? First, let's just acknowledge that to many of us, Apollos' advice seems like the utmost form of cruelty. It seems worse than useless. It sounds like God is a sadist, right? I'm facing impending persecution of the most horrific kind. And now Apollos is telling me that this is a good thing. I mean, this is quite frankly, foreign to our whole, our whole way of thinking. Why? Well, I'd argue that because white evangelical Christianity has historically enjoyed such a privileged position in the United States that by and large, it's lost any place in its theology for suffering. We've confused our experience as white Americans with the Christian experience, and we've allowed it to influence our theology. We assume that we're entitled to a growing stock market, a bigger house, and a great job. Now, I don't include African-American Christians in this critique, right? Because they have experienced suffering. They, ha they have a place in their theology for suffering. So rather than undergo any suffering as Christians, we often expect God to deliver us from ever having to experience suffering. Don't believe me? Well, the New York Times reports on March 15th Guillermo Maldonado, who calls himself an apostle and hosted President Trump earlier this year at a campaign event at his Miami megachurch, recently urged his congregants to show up for worship services in person. Quote, do you believe God would bring his people to his house to be contagious with the virus? Of course not, he said. Rodney Howard Brown, pastor of a Tampa Bay Church in Florida mocked people concerned about the disease as pansies and insisted he would only shutter the doors to his packed church, quote, when the rapture is taking place. And in a sermon that was live streamed on Facebook, Tony Spell, a pastor in Louisiana, said, we're also going to pass out anointed handkerchiefs to people who may have a fear, who may have a sickness, and we believe that when those anointed handkerchiefs go, that healing virtue is going to go on them as well. So many American Christians believe that God is not going to permit them to experience suffering. And I think they're going to be quite unprepared if, in fact, it turns out otherwise. So I'm concerned because of how prevalent such an attitude is among many American Christians. And I want us as a church to be prepared. I don't want us to be taken unaware if, in fact, we do go through difficulty, right? I don't want us to doubt God's goodness or character, to feel that somehow what is happening if we struggle, if we go through difficulties or suffering, is somehow unusual for God's people. During this time, you know, I think we need to look to the example of the early Christians. They faced tremendous suffering, right? Clearly from what we read from Tacitus's uh, passage there. They faced tremendous suffering, and God didn't deliver them from that suffering, but he was there in the midst of it, giving them strength and grace they needed to get through it, a strength and grace that enabled them to reflect God's character in a way that caused many to turn to God 
and his kingdom to advance. Here's how the early Christians dealt with a situation similar to ours. The early Christian historian Eusebius, writing in the fourth century, tells how a plague fell upon the Roman Empire. This was a plague, incidentally, that killed from a quarter to one third of the population of the Roman Empire. Okay? Eusebius writes, out of the blue came this disease, a thing more terrifying to pagans than any terror, more frightful than any disaster. To us Christians, it was not that, but a schooling and testing as valuable as all our earlier trials. For it did not pass us over, though its full impact fell on the heathen, most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of the danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ, and with them departed this life serenely happy. For they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. Many in nursing and curing others transferred their death to themselves and died in their stead turning the common formula that is normally an empty courtesy into a reality. Your humble servant bids you goodbye. The best of our brothers and sisters lost their lives in this way. The heathen behaved in the very opposite way. At the first onset of the disease, they pushed the sufferers away and fled from their dearest, throwing them into the roads before they were dead and treating unburied corpses as dirt, hoping therefore to avert the spread of the fatal disease. Sociologist Rodney Stark points out that many pagans impressed by the behavior of the Christians during the pandemic and looking for, for community after the pandemic because their family members had died, joined the church as a result. The church grew tremendously because of the way they responded to the pandemic that swept through the Roman Empire. So I think one thing we can do during this very difficult time is to look to the example of, the, of Christians down through the ages who have responded in times of crisis by loving their neighbors and not just thinking about their own safety and security. It's at this point where I have to admit to failing completely. We were talking last night at dinner about some pastors in town, friends of mine, who rented out their Airbnb to folks from New York City, from the New York City area. And all I could think of was, great, what are these people doing, right? Don't they know that this is how the virus is going to get to us? See, all I'm thinking of is building my moat around my family and hoarding my guns and ammo, protecting my own, and to heck with everybody else. And Wesley says, well, Dad, isn't that a way to love people? You know, it's at times like that where I'm unpleasantly surprised by just how far I still have to go in this whole faith journey. So I admit to being very challenged by this idea of loving other people, right? My, my human reaction is I prepared for this. I'm like a quasi prepper. Don't tell anybody. Like I prepared for this. Hey, I finally, I knew it was going to happen. <laughs> I knew it was going to happen. You know, and I'm like, oh, you people who didn't prepare. Ha! You know, and so I, I, I confess that I really struggle with this whole idea of, look, do we love our neighbors? Do we reach out to those people? And in the process, risk harming ourselves or our families. And so I'm challenged by the example that the early Christians set, right? And so I hope that, I hope that as opportunity is given me that I'm able to respond in love and reach out to those in love. And, I, and my hope is for us as a church that we can all strive for that, right? President Trump and his advisors have said the next several weeks are going to be a very difficult time, and that as many as 200,000 of our neighbors and fellow citizens are going to die. 
I pray that, that this prediction is wrong. But if it isn't, what can this passage from Hebrews tell us about how to face it, face this crisis in such a way that we don't dishonor our Lord, the one who suffered so much on our behalf? Well, I think if we respond Bond to this crisis with trust and faith, it will produce in us, as Apollos reminds us in verse 11, a harvest of righteousness and peace, which means we will grow in holiness, maturity, and peace. But if we turn away from God and become bitter, it will become a judgment upon us. What do I mean by that? Well, when it's first extracted, gold often contains a number of impurities like zinc, iron, and copper. But if it is then heated to the melting point, all these impurities collect on the surface as dross, right? Leaving only the pure gold behind. This process has often therefore been used as a metaphor to describe the way that God sometimes uses suffering in our lives to mature us. If when faced by difficulty, we respond with trust in God, humility, and patience, the hardship becomes a fire which purifies us. And so we emerge from the furnace of suffering, the purest of gold. We've matured. And I've said this before, but I've reached a point in my life where I feel that maturity in the Christian life comes largely through suffering. Could be wrong in that, but in my own life, um, that's been true. But here's the kicker. If instead we respond to suffering by complaining or fretting, uh, by blaming God or, or other people, if we become bitter, then we regress rather than mature. The suffering becomes a judgment, and we merely lengthen the time we must spend in the furnace. So in one way, this pandemic can be a blessing to us. It depends on how we respond when things get tough, as it seems they are going to. And finally, I believe this pandemic is going to reveal the true nature of our relationship with God. Do we love God because of what he does for us or because of who he is? And quite frankly, do we stop loving him and serving him when things get tough? Or do we keep walking in faith and allegiance to him, even when he doesn't seem to be there, when he doesn't seem to be answering our prayers? I think learning to walk by faith and not by sight is one of the steps in the often difficult journey towards maturity in the Christian life. And I hope, again, that it is a truth that we as a community, uh, as brothers and sisters, can grow in during this difficult time. Will you pray with me? Father, um, Lord, we don't always understand. Lord, there are things that uh, are too high for us to understand. And Lord, we don't always understand why you allow suffering, why some people have to go through suffering and other people don't. But Lord, one thing we do uh, hold on to is the belief that you're good that you're loving, that you're a loving heavenly father. And so, Father, uh, in the months ahead, uh, Lord, help us to continue uh, to walk daily with you, to, to hope in you, and to trust in you, and to affirm your goodness. And, Father, may we reflect your character and your love to those around us. Father, help us not to kind of retreat into our respective little castles and, um, you know, keep everyone out. But Father, may we look for ways during this time to reflect your love, to love those around us, to love our neighbors, uh, to love our friends, to love one another. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I did want to say, as, as Robin mentioned, that this is Palm Sunday. This is the day when traditionally uh, we've celebrated Jesus's triumphant entrance into Jerusalem. 
It's the it's the week leading up to Easter, right? So uh, Easter is uh, this coming Sunday, next Sunday, and we are making a devotional book available, uh, both I think online. I think Angela is providing a link to it, <laughs> and um, I think she also may be sending out a link in the newsletter this week. And it's a devotional booklet that uh, I encourage you to get and use this week um, during this last week of Lent. And um, also want to encourage you, it would be a very appropriate time this week, the last week of Lent, um, to maybe think about if you, if you haven't already given up something for Lent, or if you have, uh, you know, even to consider giving up something more. I would encourage us as a community to uh, spend this week really in fasting and prayer and seeking the Lord during this time. Um, we are also going to have a Good Friday service this coming Friday. And again, we'll be getting you information on how to participate in that service. We're hoping it, it's going to be a participatory uh, Zoom experience. And Angela will, will be getting you that information and the links on how to join us for that. Um, and finally, I want to encourage you. I do think that during this time, uh, as is understandable, many people are beginning to think about eternal things. Uh, many of the, the things that they've put their trust in or built their life around uh, are uh, coming, you know, crashing down. And so I think there's an increased openness on the part of many people to consider eternal things. So I want to encourage you to invite, if you have any friends or family who you think might want to join us next Sunday for our Easter service, I want to encourage you to tell them uh, about that and encourage them to join us. It's going to be a great message. Elijah is going to be speaking, and we're going to be having a panel discussion with uh, Pei and Aloja and Angie Brown. Um, so I think it's really going to be a, a special message and conversation and just want to encourage you again to invite invite any friends uh, to that service you might think would be interested so god bless good seeing everybody's face <laughs>